Many of America's allies around the world are looking on aghast. The Financial Times editorial about the Trump administration's crackdown on peaceful protests is titled America's Battered Moral Standing. Rula Khalaf is the paper's new editor and the first woman to hold that post. She says this is undermining Washington's ability to hold the high ground with authoritarian regimes abroad. Here she's talking to our Walter Isaacson about the challenges of these turbulent times. Thank you, Christian and Rula. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. This past uh, week, we saw the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square uprising. It was uh, commemorated in Hong Kong by huge protests. And there were also huge protests around the United States and in certain places around the world because of the killing of George Floyd. What was going through your head as you saw the protests around the world and especially how the protests were playing out in the United States? Um, I think this is a this is a really good point because uh, the the U.S. of course has reacted to the Hong Kong uh, protests um, in the way that one would expect, um, but the president has not reacted to the U.S. protests in the way that one would expect, um, and I think this is the difference that shocks and dismays. Um, a lot of people are around the world. Uh, because what, what credibility uh, does the U.S. have uh, when it calls uh, on, um, on Hong, the Hong Kong authorities or the Chinese authorities um, to uh, treat protesters better, uh, peaceful protesters um, with respect, when in, in the U.S. itself, the call is, you know, to send the army out, and when you know protesters are being removed, so that the president can have a photo uh, op. So I think this whole episode um, further uh, erodes the the credibility of of the U.S., but also the moral authority of the U.S. I mean, I have covered a lot of protests in 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 my career, in revolutions and and uprisings, and everyone. Uh, would look to the U.S., would hang on every word that the State Department or, or the White House would, would utter is, and there's always been the belief that if the, that the U.S. is the only um, outside power that can make a difference and that can have, um, that can exert pressure on, on governments to actually act um, and not to, um, and not to deal with protests uh, forcefully and not to crack down on peaceful protests. When you saw the killing of George Floyd, the knee on the neck and him gasping, saying he couldn't breathe, what, re what ramifications, repercussions did that have both in Britain and in Europe? Um, I think very similar um, to the repercussions that any you know, American would have would have uh, would have had. Um, it, of course, there's always a de delayed reaction if you're not in um, the country where um, such an outrage of um, act took place. So I think you know, day after day, um, the anger and the outrage felt um, by um, people outside of the U.S. Uh, turned into protests. And I think pr the protest that I've seen in Europe and in the UK, part of it is about uh, the killing of George Floyd, but I think part of it is also uh, about the discrimination that, that people feel in their own um, countries. Um, so I think this has been, I would say, perhaps a, a wake-up call for, for a lot of people. I mean, you know, on, on, a, on a personal level and on a professional level, um, I think it also makes you think about diversity in, in, in the workplace. And we talk a lot about diversity, but, you know, are we really diverse? I think this is the debate that's also going on in a lot of companies in Europe today. You've been an expert in covering China, both uh, as a journalist yourself and your newspaper. What do you see that the West should be doing or the Trump administration should be doing to get China policy back on an even keel? 
I think we're in a very, very tricky uh, situation uh, right now because a lot of the assumptions that the West has had about China, not least that economic prosperity would eventually lead uh, to a certain level of political liberalization. I mean, that assumption um, has not borne out. But what I think the Western governments also did not expect is the um, consolidation of power by uh, Xi Jinping and um, the, the increasing tilt towards even greater authoritarianism. Um, so this is on the Chinese side. On the US side, you have also had a hardening of, uh, of attitude, not just uh, in the White House, but across the political spectrum. Of course, the fact that um, the president also uh, uses China as uh, a, a political football in, his domest in, in domestic politics as well, that doesn't help. So what I now see is um, uh, an escalating spiral. Um, and we, we've just written an, an editorial about this, where we said that uh, what we need is a kind of reset. You have to agree uh, with the Chinese to disagree on certain things. We're, no one is going to be in, uh, supportive of the policy in Hong Kong, uh, human rights violation, uh, a potential you know, hardening of Chinese attitudes towards, uh, towards Taiwan. But there are areas where you could still cooperate. Climate change is, is one of them, um, trade and commercial relations. And there has to be a, a, at least an attempt to separate what you can work with China on and what you cannot. I just want to push back there. You say we can cooperate on climate change. We can co cooperate on trade. But th that's those are things that the U.S. doesn't want to cooperate on. Yes, and, and this is where I was going, is am I optimistic about this? I'm not optimistic in uh, in the short term, no. Because I think that in the next few months, as we get closer to the U.S. election, I think this relationship is, uh, is going to de deteriorate further. Um, now, I think we have to start looking post the election, whether it is a Republican or a Democratic administration. Because I think once you've gone, you know, once you've moved away from um, the, the politicking, then maybe that can be the time uh, to rethink the relationship with, with, with China and to put it on a, on a different footing. And I also think that this is not just an issue between the US and China. You know, Europe is a major power here, and Europe has a role to play. Um, I think the Europeans in the past few months have uh, not actually just blindly gone behind uh, behind the U.S. Uh, the Huawei case, uh, for example, where both Germany and the U.K. have been a lot more balanced in, in their attitude to, to Huawei. At the core of what the Financial Times has stood for throughout its history, is the importance of free markets, free trade, free ideas, you know, a good economic system, a very sober-minded approach to the world. And yet over the past 20 or 30 years, we've seen this backlash against globalization, a backlash against free trade, against immigration, a, a sort of a populist feeling that uh, Financial Times readers should not be ruling uh, the world or consolidating Europe. What are the <laughs> underlying... You mean the Davos elite. The Davos elite who subscribe to the Financial Times, their world has been upended by this populist backlash. What's the cause of that? Uh, and by the way, did we, and I put myself in the category of a Financial Times reader, get things wrong? Did we misunderstand the resentments that were being built up because of globalization, trade, and immigration? Um, I'll say a few things. Uh, first, I do think we have to remember uh, how much benefit globalization has brought, how many people um, were lifted out of poverty around the world. Um, I think that the reason that we have seen a rise in populist nationalism and a backlash against globalization is is because of the way um, that it was managed or rather mismanaged 
um, in in terms of its impact on on certain community. I mean, you know, Brexit, for example, is is an example of of, uh, of the backlash, um, and that is because, you know. What I think a lot of um, policymakers uh, forgot um, is that right around them, in their own backyard, there, there was an impact that was not being uh, addressed. Um, that is, I think, one of the mistakes. I think the other is you have to go back to the financial crisis and the excess of, of the financial crisis. Um, often, uh, when you have big shocks, um, the ramifications aren't necessarily felt, can, you know, not all the ramifications are felt right away. Some of it comes with a del delayed uh, reaction. Um, and I think part of this, the, 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 the new sort of sentiment of being anti-EU, anti-globalization, has to do with the fact that inequality um, has widened um, in, in the last um, decade. And nothing was done about it. We were just, you know, moving ahead and thinking about the stock market. Um, and I think that it was almost, you know, it's, it was a, it's a wake up call. It's a wake up call to say, okay, what has gone wrong? Uh, how do we reset capitalism? Uh, what should be uh, the policies that are more distributive? Uh, without losing sight of the benefits uh, of, of globalization. I mean, we are, of course, and will always remain um, advocates of free trade and, and free markets because we think that that is where the econo economic benefit is for everyone. Um, but we also have to take into account um, the pitfalls, um, the, the where it needs to be reset. And, and reform. But let me push back on you a little bit. Okay. Haven't the events in the recent five to 10 years caused you to question a little bit more the absolute benefits of free trade? Um, I wouldn't say to question. I would say um, to, to think a lot harder about the impact of free trade, not only on countries that are um, where production is cheaper, for example, but the impact on you know the UK, for ex for for example. And I mean, you say free trade. We can talk about free trade and free movement. And it, in the UK, in particular, there were communities that should have should have been supported. Um, uh, at a time when borders were were completely open to other uh, EU nationals, and that and that didn't happen. So you know, it's not a it's not a question of um, you know do I question it intellectually? I think um, questioning it, qu questioning the practice and the impact. Uh, yes, certainly. And I mean, you know, we've written an awful lot about this. You're just coming out of lockdown now. This past week, you're taking the baby steps over there in Britain uh, to come out. Do you think that the timing is right? Are you sending your kid back to school, in other words? Um, I am. I sent my kid back to school uh, yesterday for, for the first time because his class uh, is back. Um, I think generally a lot of people still feel that we're coming out of lockdown early um, because the number of infections is still high, uh, the number of daily deaths is still higher than most other European countries. I think generally um, it is felt, and we certainly say that in our editorials at the FT, um, that this crisis was not well managed. By the government. Of course, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson did himself get uh, sick um, and was in hospital for, for a while. And of course, that didn't um, help. Uh, but we feel that generally this has not been handled properly. And our concern is that as we come up, come out of the lockdown, uh, the test and trace system that is needed for an effective uh, easing um, is still not there yet. Well, as the Financial Times, you cover very much both the finances of the world, but also Europe and then Britain. Uh, do you think that with Brexit looming or coming down the pike, you not only need to figure out what the European Central Bank is going to do, but what the Bank of England is going to do? And how will that play out? 
the government's argument is that we should go ahead and have um, and leave the EU for good because we have already officially left the EU. Whether we get a comprehensive deal um, with, with the European Union or we could do it without a deal. And some of the arguments that you hear is that because the COVID uh, has had such a negative impact on, on the economy, um, and because we have to think anew about what the structure of the economy is, what the fundamentals are, what kind of economy we want, that we might as well just, you know, have Brexit at the end of the year with or without a deal. Most economists, however, and that is certainly a position held um, by, by uh, the FT, um, is that you are facing, you know, we're still dealing with a real shock. And we now see, not only in Britain, but everywhere, what we are calling a recovery. Uh, but that is because we have, we've reached the bottom and we're coming back uh, up, whatever shape uh, this takes. But the reality is that there's, in a few months, we will know how much scarring there has been. And what I mean by that is we're not going to return to the same level that we were at just before the, the pandemic. Uh, so we will be facing uh, a very, very difficult economic situation with millions of people who are unemployed, with sectors that are completely uh, ravaged. And so it, it would be an added burden on businesses and on the economy to actually uh, leave the European Union at the end of the year without a deal, i.e. In, in, in a fashion that is not orderly. Thank you, Rula, for joining us. Thanks for having me.